Welcome everyone. We are getting started now with our webinar with Allison Hand. So I'm going to give you a few housekeeping logistics for our webinar before we get started. So we are recording this webinar for your viewing for replay later on. And if you registered and you're watching us live, you'll receive a, an email in about 24 hours with the recording and the slide deck as well. And if you're watching in replay, then you, you can just access the webinar through YouTube and our Sideless Education website too. If you're watching live and viewing and participating alongside us, you have the option to chat with us in the chat feature below, but just be sure that you're chatting with panelists and everyone or all attendees. If you just chat with panelists, then only the three of us will see what you have to say. And if there is a Zoom failure by any chance, then please go on to sidelesseducation.com and click on the webinars tab and we'll give you more information about how to connect with us so we can continue on with the webinar. And I'm gonna pass it on over now to Anna Mattis who's gonna introduce our featured speaker. All righty. And Ali, if you'll go ahead and go to the next slide so people can see your beautiful face and the title of the training to make sure in the right place. It is my pleasure today to get to introduce Allison to everybody. Um, if you heard us chatting a little bit earlier, Ali hails from the great state of New Mexico and she got to be my personal tour guide there a number of years ago, which is a trip I'll never forget. She comes from a family of educators and that's really special because she's had such extensive teaching experience, especially with middle school and high school, ELAR and ELAR. She is, in my book, an expert instructional coach when it comes to working with teachers of ESLs, uh, ESL students and best practices in ESL. So there's no better person today than to lead us on this webinar. And I'm really excited because Ali and I got to spend so many years working together at Region 13 in Austin. And I see we have several Region 13 former clients here with us. So we're really happy to see you. And it is just my pleasure to get to work with Ali again in this capacity. So without further ado, she's going to take it away. Well, and hello, hello right and now. thank you for that introduction, Anna. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always nice to have some glows. So um, today we're going to be talking about building speaking proficiency during distance learning. Um, and although we're talking about distance learning, a lot of these strategies we can plug right in when we get back into our classrooms as well. Um, so, you know, we can use these in both uh, settings. Of course, there we go. So I know that we've gone through a lot of changes. Uh, for me in particular, I went from being in classrooms and getting to discuss and work with amazing teachers and students um, and being face to face with uh, others, <laughs> actual face to face. Um, and now what I'm spending most of my time doing um, other than working, which I am working quite a bit, um, but I've spent a lot of time doing other things. So I've gotten back into puzzling um, and my garden is doing very well. I am less of a plant murderess and more of a gardener these days. Um, we have new employees in our house. So uh, this is my newest uh, office mate and she spends most of her time sound asleep. Um, and we've done some cooking and of course, lots and lots and lots of Zoom. But really what I found is I'm losing some of that academic vocabulary myself and I'm finding myself searching for more language because I'm not having those interactions that I was having uh, when I was face to face or in the classrooms, talking to kiddos, working with teachers. Um, so, you know, even when we are in the Zoom uh, situation, it's not the same amount of conversation that's happening face to face. And so why is it important that we get our students to spend more time talking and speaking? Well, I think James Britton says it best when he says reading and writing float on a sea of talk. And so if our students are practicing that language, then the literacy skills of reading and writing start to deteriorate as well. And so let's look at, well, what are our goals for today? Um, our content objective is we're gonna identify ways to support our English learners speaking proficiency practice during distance learning. And 
We're going to know that we did that through our language objective. So we're going to share ideas for supporting language learners during speaking activities using our sentence stem. One way I can support my students when speaking is. And it would be amazing if we could all speak that today. Um, and we we can speak it to ourselves, but we're going to share on our chat as well. It just 425 of us would take a while to get around to the speaking. <laughs> but um, we are going to talk about how do we support our, our language learners while they're speaking. So a few more reasons why it's important for our students to talk or to practice talking. We want to increase their English proficiency. So uh, our students maybe aren't having the opportunity to build that language proficiency at home if the people that they are currently quarantined with um, are maybe speaking a different language because that's their native language um, or if interaction at the academic level has kind of tapered off because of the um, lack of opportunity to practice that language. So we really want to help our students practice that academic vocabulary. Academic vocabulary is a struggle for a lot of our students, not just our uh, English learners. Our native speakers struggle with that academic vocabulary as well. So we want to make sure that everyone's practicing it so that they can start to accept that and claim that language as their own. Uh, another reason is it's a great way to know uh, how much your students are understanding. So when we ask our students to explain something or to describe something or to uh, speak about a topic, it's a great formative assessment. How much are they understanding? And if they are running into hiccups, where is that misunderstanding happening? So it's a wonderful formal assess uh, formative assessment. Um, and finally, of course, it will increase their reading and writing. So the more we can get our students to practice that vocabulary, to practice speaking, we can help them increase their reading and writing skills as well. So any resources that I'm going to talk about today can be found on our bit.ly, or sorry, on our Padlet using our bit.ly. So uh, go ahead. I'm going to give you just a couple of seconds. You can grab your phone and scan me to get to it, or you can type it in and our bit.ly link will be on all our slides. So don't worry if you miss it right now, you can get to it later. Um, but the research that I looked that I was looking into as well as um, resources for building language um, and having our students speak it are all on our Padlet. So you can find all our resources here that we're gonna talk about today. All right, so we, of course, I mentioned this earlier, we can do this synchronously or asynchronously. Now we're doing distance learning right now um, and that may or may not change, we'll see what happens. But if we're doing it synchronously, then we might be using things like Zoom or Teams or Google Hangout. And that means we're all working together and our students are having an opportunity maybe to speak to partners in small group or to whole group in our classes. We can also have our students speak asynchronously. So things like Flipgrid and Seesaw, or if you're using a podcasting app, all of those are great ways to get your students to speak asynchronously. Now, not all our kids have access to computers um, or are sharing computers with others in their household. So if we need a little lower tech version of it, don't forget that any smartphone has a voice memo and you can have your students just record their speaking and uh, text it to you using your voice memo. So even if our students don't have access to all these lovely websites, uh, they can still do these activities in a low tech way using a smartphone that has a speaker. All right. So what do our students need in order to be successful in a speaking activity? They need three things. They need comprehensible input. They need something to respond to. They need access to that language that we want them to use. And they need a way to organize their thoughts so that they're able to be very clear with what they're saying. So let's look at these all individually. We're gonna start with that comprehensible input piece. So when we talk about comprehensible input, we're talking about 
things that they understand. So they need to read or listen to something that they understand or be posed a question that they are able to respond to. So our first is a well-crafted question. If you haven't had a chance, go watch Nancy Motley's uh, Better Questions for Deeper Thinking. She does a phenomenal job explaining how to write rich, relevant questions. Um, I know when I was first in the classroom as a baby teacher, I thought I wrote phenomenal questions and I would be so excited to ask them and then the answer would come back, yes. And there would be no more information. And so it was, it's really thinking about what is a well-crafted question that gets your students to excited about responding, but also able to uh, expand on what they're saying. So well-crafted questions, Nancy Motley, phenomenal webinar. Uh, you can also have your students respond to visuals. So visuals could be, if we're in math, we can have a math problem that our student has solved, and that is their visual to help them with cues to respond so they could explain what they did in their steps. Um, if we are going through a timeline or through a uh, graph or a graphic, we can have our students use that information to explain to us what they're doing or what they're thinking. And finally, uh, if your students are taking notes or using sketch notes or having them draw out something and then respond using that visual, okay? We can also use, of course, video and audio. Lots of wonderful stuff out there for our ESL students. Uh, YouTube is a great place to find um, good comprehensible input. Video is great because we can gain extra cues, even if we don't understand all the words, we're definitely gaining a lot of information based on the visual um, that we're seeing. News and Slow English is phenomenal for ESL. So if, you've not, if you're not familiar with that site, it's a great place for our students to go and have some comprehensible input at their level that they can respond to. And of course, podcasts are always wonderful ways to get your students uh, engaged in, a con in content that they can respond to. And so our last one is articles and stories. So absolutely comprehensible input could be responding to a reading that we've asked our students to do. So any of these things are a great way to start with your students on how are we gonna get them to talk about something. So they need something to talk about. Now let's talk about, well, how do we help them organize or think about their ideas? So we have to think about this as language function. So we're gonna look at several different types of language function. So I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. I'm gonna give you some prompts and I want you to think about how would you respond to them and how are they different from each other? So our first prompt is, I want you to describe your best friend. What words might you use? How would you put your sentences together? Just take, 10 more seconds, think about who your best friend is. What are, how would you describe them? Okay, well, how would this idea vary if I gave you a different prompt? Explain how to log into a Zoom meeting. So think about what happens when you log into a Zoom meeting. How is that different than when I've asked you to describe your best friend? Think about the language being used. And finally, what if I asked you to explain the difference between synchronous and asynchronous learning? How has our language, the language we're asking you to use changed? Okay. Well, let's break this down and think about it. Oops, sorry. So in our first one, we've asked you to describe your best friend. When we ask someone to describe something, it is a description. So it doesn't require that we do it in any particular order. It's very adjective heavy, um, and it really allows for uh, kind of an open idea. And so our students are able to share lots of different information and not worry necessarily about the order in which they're sharing it. Versus if I ask you to explain how to log into a Zoom meeting, this is a sequence question. It matters what order we give the information. And so if we're not giving information in the correct order, 
we're not going to be successful in what we're doing. And finally, we have a compare and contrast uh, prompt. And here, we really, there's a lot of language around comparing and contrasting that our students need access to in order to do it. So can they say things are similar or can they use the word similarly? Are they able to say that there are differences? So there's a lot of language being used in our compare and contrast versus when we asked you to describe, all right? So let's talk about, well, how do we set our students up for success once we've discovered what we're going to ask them to talk about? So the second piece they need is they need that academic language. So when we talk about academic language, we have two big ideas here. We have brick words and mortar words. Um, and I know you've probably heard this before, but let's do a quick review so that we can remember what brick words and mortar words are. Brick words are our content specific vocabulary. It's found in our glossaries and we really wanna make sure we're teaching this directly. We, these are words our students are going to need to practice. And so we wanna make sure that they have access to that language. And finally, our mortar words, these are cross-curricular academic vocabulary. They hold those brick words together in an academic context. So in reading or writing, um, they, are a, they can be found in all our academic areas. We can't teach all of them explicitly. So we wanna make sure that we're using them and then we provide our students sentence stems and the language that they need and then to, so that they can practice them as well. So when it comes to brick words for our ELA, we could say things, we could have words like exposition or rhetorical device. For science, things like kinetic energy or producer, whatever your content specific vocabulary that you want your students to use, we want to make sure they have access to it. So it could be things like a word bank if we're working asynchronously. If we're working synchronously, I could say things like I'm listening for and then tell our students what the language is that we want them to use. Um, giving them sentence stems is a great way to help them know how they're going to use that in context. And then of course, adding it to our language objectives so that our students know what our goal is and how they're going to use language. For mortar words, mortar words, are we can give them things like sentence starters. Um, if you've seen our academic language cards from uh, Marcy Voss, they are phenomenal for getting that mortar language together and helping your students frame what they're going to say so that they're able to express themselves in full thoughts. Uh, we also have lots of mortar language and sentence stems and our sheltered instruction book. Um, great, great sentence stems there. Or uh, on your um, not bit.ly, on your Padlet, <laughs> you can find um, a language function toolkit that has a lot of this as well. Um, and that is from Kate Kinsella. It's a phenomenal toolkit. It's one I use often with teachers. So when we talk about description, we wanna think about what is the mortar language for description? Well, we need things like, for example, or to illustrate another additionally, or if we're asking our students to sequence, we wanna give them the language to be able to say things like before, first, subsequently. So we wanna help them know how to use that language to move from idea, from, from idea to idea. And finally, uh, compare and contrast. We have words like as opposed to or in contrast. So we wanna make sure our students have access to that language. And then we need to help them with a way to organize their ideas. So if our students don't have a way to organize their thoughts, we get jumbled uh, we get jumbled answers or answers that aren't complete or maybe don't make a lot of sense. Things like our sequences are out of order. So we want to help them to organize their thoughts. So graphic organizers are phenomenal for this. Uh, again, in the language function toolkit on your Padlet, um, Kate Kinsella not only provides sentence stems, she also has lots of graphic organizers that match those language functions. So if I was asking for someone to describe, a, a bubble map would make perfect sense. So we're gonna put our best friend in the center and we're gonna add our adjectives around. Versus sequencing, of course, we want them to put things in order. And, if, and compare and contrast, a Venn diagram is always a great organizer. Um, but you know, students don't always know when to use it. 
So helping them see when it's appropriate to use a Venn diagram. So compare and contrast there. So those are the three things that our students need in order to be successful when we ask them to speak. So they need comprehensible input, they need the academic language that we want them to practice, and then they need a way to organize their ideas. Our final thought here is we're gonna talk about, well, how do we help our students understand what we want them to do when we ask them to provide a speaking sample to us? So if you've read Nancy Motley's Talk Read, Talk Write, uh, one of her strategies is example, non-example. Um, so we can use the same strategy for our students when we're asking them to speak. So example, non-example is as simple as it sounds. We provide our students with an example of what is the, what is the top? What do we want our students to be able to do? So here's an example of our ideal answer. So if we asked our students to explain how they solved for X using a sentence stem, then we would want to see that sentence stem in their answer. And we would wanna see all those brick words that we've talked about, as well as those mortar words, those transi transition pieces that put their ideas together. Now, a perfect example can feel overwhelming for ESL students sometimes. And so we don't want to um, make them feel like if they can't do it right the first time, it's never gonna be right. So non-example shows our students, well, you know, this is the informal non-academic example. They've still used the sentence stem, but it, it's not enough information. So we give a non-example so that our ESL students can see, okay, I'm reaching for this and I'm gonna get there, but I know I can do better than the non-example. So it gives me a gauge as a learner to see, okay, this is where I can go from here. So here's, here's a non-example. We're not using the academic language. We, this is what we don't want. And we're aiming for that example, that stellar, oops, that stellar example that we want them to work on. Okay, so example, non-example, really awesome activity for reading and for writing, um, helps your students gauge what it is that you're really asking them to do. So if you're using Flipgrid, record yourselves and show your, your students what that example is. Um, if you are doing examples with your students synchronously, then have role play with your students and practice with each other and show them, you know, this is what I want it to sound like. This is what we don't want it to sound like. That can be very helpful for our students as well. So let's see if we met our goals for today. Did we identify ways to support our ELs speaking proficiency practice during distance learning? And we're gonna know if we did, because we're gonna ask you to share now. So share your ideas for supporting language learners during speaking activities using our sentence stem. So I know it's not ideal not to do this speaking wise, <laughs> but again, there's a lot of us here. So go ahead in our chat if we can get one way I can support my students when speaking is. Okay, so one way is giving sentence stems by providing sentence stems. Um, thank you, thank you. By giving them video examples, thank you, Edith. And Esther, by using graphic organizers, wonderful. Um, <laughs> Hi, John. <laughs> John Seidlitz responded too. <laughs> um, when speaking is, oh, these are flying by. And of course I don't have my glasses on. Uh, color coding to show brick and mortar words in our, ac our academic examples. Uh, Marina giving example, non-example. Um, and let's see one more. Oh my goodness, you guys, wonderful answers. So quick. Um, one way I can support my students when speaking is, oh my goodness, um, by having them use sentence stems. Perfect. And by providing a word bank. Awesome. Thank you guys for all of you who were willing to share with us. So before we, before I hand it back over, if you like what you heard today, um, we are working on a uh, telepass. 
moving ELs forward on the TELPASS, which is the Texas state assessment. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. It is the Texas language assessment. However, the strategies that we're going to talk about um, and the ways that we're going to help our help um, teachers understand how do we provide opportunities for our students to listen, speak, read, and write in the classroom can be used in any classroom. Um, we will talk specifically about our Texas ELPS um, and of course our TELPASS, which is our state test. But if you're a WIDA district or if you use a uh, Alps 20 or 21st in, I'm sorry, no, I lost on that one. Um, it, it's fine. The strategies will work just the same for our uh, classrooms. So look for it coming this fall. Uh, we're excited to offer opportunities to really show how do we model to build proficiency in our classrooms, all academic content areas. We can listen, speak, read, and write in art, in CTE, in math, in science, in PE. We can model it in all our classrooms. So look for that coming fall of 2020, and you can see it on the Sidelets website. So here's my contact information. If you want more information, you can, of course, email me, or you can find us on Twitter. Uh, I am hand underscore Allie, and we have at Sidelets underscore Ed. So before we end, Valentina, were there any questions from the chat that we want to cover? Ali, I actually have some questions for oh. you that I was okay. going, that I recorded. I have two. So specifically, when you were going over the, the language function toolkit, the paragraph frames and the word bank, um, one of our participants said that she actually uses them daily in her ESL lessons, but she wanted to know how you would approach this when teaching virtually. So how would you manipulate all these tools at the same time? Do you have any tips for that? So virtually, I would say focus on one uh, language function at a time. So it can be very overwhelming. In a classroom, we can get our, our posters up and we can go back to our anchor charts and point them out and say which one we would want to do. In a virtual environment, I think we need to really focus in on one at a time so that our students aren't overwhelmed or confused. Um, and then providing that, we can do it through the Google Doc. Uh, I, today, I did a... Um, shared writing activity where I already had the sentence stems on the screen for them and then they worked through the sentence stems in order to answer or complete the paragraph. So you can do the same thing virtually with your students. Good. Okay, that's great. Um, I, one that's right up your alley. Alley, ha, that's funny. Okay, <laughs> is there a resource or curriculum that you would recommend for new teachers at ESOL? I know you might have some great recommendations for people. Oh, new teachers of ESL. Well, I'm a little biased because I'm gonna tell you the one I used. <laughs> um, we used uh, the National Geographic Edge um, <clears throat> and their newcomer stuff is really good. So um, I don't know what your levels of your students are, but the National Geographic um, program does go, uh, I believe A through F, if not higher, and they have a newcomers program as well. So, um, but that's just me. There's lots and lots out there. Um, the, um, I'm gonna look on my shelf real quick. The access, if access has great stuff for content areas. Um, so math and science, and of course, you know, ESL is a wealth of sharing with each other. So if you guys have other ideas or really love the content you use, throw it in the chat and help help our new teachers out. Sharing is caring and teaching is just sharing with others. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, you have a lot of people already going through and yeah. sharing their resources. Good. Okay. Awesome. Do you want to go ahead and go to the next slide then? While we Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. So if you're new to us for this webinar, we do a Twitter chat the first and third Tuesday of every month. You just have to find us under the hashtag Sidelets Ed chat. And that's from 7 to 7.30 in the evening. We also publish a blog. We've been coming out recently with weekly posts at sidelitsblog.org. So you can find wonderful information and some posts from guest authors coming out. And then we're excited to tell you about a couple of upcoming webinars and conferences we have if you want to go ahead to the next slide. You can see, oh, there. 
Okay, so this Friday, Supporting Literacy at Home, Seven Steps for Parents. If you already subscribed to our blog, you'll see that a post came out today that references this very webinar that's happening on Friday with Natalia Heckman and Jordan Greer, who's joining us from Frisco ISD. We have, you can see next week, the 26th, we may have noticed that we've been doing a couple of our webinars in Spanish, just in support of our bilingual and biliteracy team. So we'll have Dr. Patricia Morales again with us in Spanish on the 26th, Sally Barnes doing a specific load training, but also wonderful for ESL teachers that are familiar with step six and step seven of the seven steps that's on the 28th. And then Dr. Monica Lara with La Practica del Dictado, again, part of our Spanish by literacy series that we're doing webinars on. So those are some upcoming webinars. If we look at the next slide, we have some upcoming online conferences for you. Um, Adrian Mendoza, who was just with us, what day is today? Wednesday, on Monday, um, mm -hmm. talking about sheltered instruction and math. He's gonna have two different online conferences, one for more elementary focused and one for more secondary focused on the 27th and 28th. And then Dr. Michelle Izquierdo is talking about her pathways to greatness and talking about um, culturally responsive teaching and best practices for newcomers. And that's June, what is it, third and fifth. So all of those are conferences. They're not free webinars, they are conferences. So you will have to register for them, but you'll get your PD um, certificate credits for that. And you can find all the information on our website. So let's see, yep, yeah, there we go. Thank you guys again so much for joining us. You have all of our various contact information available on the right. And I will hand it back to Valentina and Ali to say goodbye. <laughs> Thank you so much. We are so happy you joined us and hope you join us again in the future. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.